cloud, I think is the correct option. Okay, so this webinar is now being recorded. Uh, so let's get started. Um, so my name's Lee Greenwood. I am the Forest Pest and Pathogen Program Director for the Nature Conservancy's North America region. Um, in that capacity, I am the overarching manager of the Don't Move Firewood um, Outreach Campaign, which is a um, outreach campaign that is focused on forest pests and pathogens and how you can reduce the spread of them and how communication can be maximized to reduce the spread of them through behavior change uh, regarding the use of firewood. Um, so the purpose of this webinar is just to kind of talk about all of our basic elements of programming, what we do, um, what are our big ticket topics, what are our events, and how you can get either hooked into our work or involved or take advantage of our materials. Um, I'm very excited to see that folks are adding into the chat their various locations and employers or affinities. That's fantastic. Uh, one thing that Laurel and I really want to focus on is that this is meant to be a short presentation by Laurel and I that covers just like the high lines of each thing so that you all can ask questions about what you're most interested in. So if you think you have a question that actually should be asked in real time, you can interrupt us. That's fine. Take yourself off mute and say, you know, I have a question about this slide or whatever. Um, but if you think it's best to just leave it to the end, that's also totally fine. And if we're about to get to your topic anyway, we'll, we'll let you know. Um, so, all right, here we are. Uh, Laurel, next slide, please. Mm -hmm. Okay, so like I sort of started fumbling over at the beginning of this presentation, firewood is a broad pathway for invasive forest insects and diseases. There's all sorts of different invasive species that can and do move on firewood. In these photographs, left to right is a ambrosia beetle, a spongy moth caterpillar, an Asian longhorn beetle, an emerald ash borer, and the latest, most prominent issue, a spotted lanternfly. All of these forest pests that are problematic can and are moved on firewood through various means. Now, in order to try to curtail this problem from the forest um, health perspective, to reduce the spread of invasive species, there's quite a few regulations that exist to either regulate the um, treatment of firewood or the movement of firewood or the sale of firewood, et cetera. But unfortunately, those regulations are typically not comprehensive even within a given region um, or country, and they are very inconsistent. So that makes those regulations harder to understand and harder to communicate and harder for both the public and the private sector to adhere to. Further making this really challenging is that new pest outbreaks come to light every year. A decade ago, I was about to say a decade ago, there was no spotted lanternfly, but actually I think we just passed that landmark. At any rate, um, each pest comes in, uh, onto the scene according to its invasion history. And some of these pests have been here since the late 1800s, others um, uh, only in the last decade. Uh, some of them have very small, discrete infestations that pop up, like the Asian longhorn beetle, whereas other ones have big, broad infestations that slowly spread, like the spongy moth. So every year, pest outbreak situations shift, and that also makes it really hard to educate people comprehensively on the issue of reducing forest pest and pathogen movement on firewood. Next slide, please. So in order to tackle these different levels of complexity, we try to always focus on our guiding principles so that we don't get caught up in which bug is where and what regulation is what and what language for what. It's too much. So we stick to the basics. What's our goal here? Laurel and I work for the Nature Conservancy. Our goal is to protect trees and make the forests of North America healthier. That's it. That's what we're here to do. In order to do that, we have a very specialized niche. We use the tactic of slowing the spread of invasive forest pests on the firewood pathway. There's many other facets of forest health that the Nature Conservancy tackles, but this particular one is the one that Laurel and I specialize in because we have, uh, the Nature Conservancy specifically has a really strong history in the space of forest pests and outreach. Now, the target for all of this information is not everyone on planet Earth because not everybody on planet Earth is moving firewood in North America. 
actually the only people we really need to reach are the firewood users and the people who try to educate them. So even if the, so the people who try to educate firewood users might be firewood um, manufacturing companies. They might be firewood treatment facilities. They might be extension agents with universities or state department of agriculture or state forestry um, employees. They might be other environmental organizations besides the Nature Conservancy. They might be federal agencies. All of these entities together at various levels attempt to educate firewood users often on the topic of forest pests and pathogens. And that's too many people. There's too many cooks in the kitchen. So what Don't Move Firewood attempts to do is bring everybody together to some unified, simple, understandable best practices and messages. And that's the next line on the slide. So the basic messages that we adhere to are the name of our campaign, Don't Move Firewood. Now, <laughs> Uh, if anybody is not on mute, please mute yourself. Um, so uh, if you stick to don't move firewood, that it, it is implicit that that means don't move firewood long distances. Every once in a while, somebody's like, wait, I shouldn't move it around in my backyard. No, of course not. Um, so don't move firewood long distances is kind of in that slogan. And then you can't tell people not to move firewood without also giving them some positive educational steps that they could take in order to use firewood. because by the nature of it, these are firewood users. So we have three basic positive steps that people can choose from according to their needs and preferences and location. Those are buy it where you burn it for people who wanna purchase firewood locally, that's great. Uh, gather it on site, sometimes that's very practical and often it's free, so people really like that one, although it's not always feasible. Or buy certified heat treated. That one's a little tricky because certified heat treated firewood is not available universally across the United States or Canada. And so um, one of the things we do as a campaign is we attempt to remind fellow educators if they are or are not in an area with significant certified heat treated firewood on the private market, because if they're not, they should probably not be using that message. It's confusing to the public. Okay, I believe the next slide belongs to Laurel. Yeah, thank you, Lee. Um, so my name is Laurel Downs, and I pretty much exclusively work on the Don't Move Firewood campaign, and so I'm going to go over uh, a lot of our resources and materials that uh, can be used by both professionals and the public, and then some of our outreach events, and even a really large firewood report that we did, which is um, a really great tool for anyone in the forest health community. So. First things first, our website is don'tmovefirewood.org, um, which if you have not already visited our website, I highly recommend you do so because this is where we have a lot of really great content um, that you can pull straight off our website or use for inspiration um, or just learn more about the firewood pathway and some of the invasive pests of concern. Um, so a great place to start if you are looking for outreach material would be our resource library. So if you go to the main page and up at the top, there's a bar with several different tabs. Resource library is one of them. Um, and this is really where we kind of archive everything we've done in terms of graphics um, and some other materials as well. And you can look at, um, you know, what we've done in the past. We've customized graphics for a lot of our partners. Uh, and you can pull pull them right off if it works for your needs, or you can use them and be like, hey, you know, we we want a graphic just like this, and we can work with you and customize the graphics for your region or situation. Uh, and that is a free service we provide. Any costs associated with that would just be printing costs on your end. Um, then we also have a really handy dandy tool, the firewood map, which is another bar at the top there. And this is a really great place to go if you're looking for information on regulations or outreach uh, or even just pest issues in a specific place in um, America or Canada. And so you just hover it over, click on the state or providence that you're interested in. And then anything that we know about that um, area is, is in that spot. And we do update that information regularly. I usually try to review it every summer or fall. And I reach out to you know, whoever's in that state, the SPRO usually, and just try to get whatever updated information I can and then, you know, check it for accuracy. And this is actually really useful for the public. So it's a great place to um, 
kind of point people in this direction any any sort of questions you might get because we take a lot of that esoteric language and a lot of, you know, legal language for regulations and we just break it down into layman's terms and try to make it as least confusing as possible for anyone who's um, looking to do like the responsible thing in terms of um, if they're going camping or something and they're wondering what the situation is where they're going. Uh, then we also have stuff like information on the species themselves. So in the invasive species tab up there and we try to keep that updated as well. Um, there's a news tab up there, anything that's going on, like this talk, for instance, is, is uh, has a landing page under that news tab. Uh, we take 10 of our most popular um, web pages, and that has been translated into Spanish, which would obviously be very useful for areas of the country where you have a lot more Spanish speakers. Um, and then, as I mentioned, just a lot of other resources that are really useful for other outreach professionals So we're reaching both the public and then also those people, as we mentioned, who are trying to educate. Um, so we have a lot of toolkits, you know, that are really helpful in those terms. Um, and then just to kind of keep our outreach new and fresh and relevant to the time of year, um, we try to keep them focused on, you know, different events that are going on. A lot of these are spearheaded by some of our partners. For instance, the National Invasive Species Awareness Week. I know a lot of other people participate in that one that just happened in February. Um, we will always, you know, repost or try to help boost um, anything that we think is, you know, at all relevant to the forest health and firewood pathway. Um, that's a big one. Um, April is Invasive Plant Pest and Disease Awareness Month. Um, so we'll for sure have a few posts on that. Emerald Ash Borer Awareness Week is a big one. Clay Clean Go is a really big one. Um, as you can see, just throughout the year, there's always something different, a little bit different to focus on. And th that really helps us reach, you know, the broadest audience that we possibly can, kind of keeps our outreach material just uh, a little less redundant. Um, and then firewood month is our baby. And that's, you know, each week of firewood month, we have a different theme uh, or audience that we're really trying to focus on. And so that's, you know, where our partner organizations really help us out is in firewood month. And of course, that's the time of year where a lot of people are camping or hunting or just getting outside and enjoying the fall weather. And so really important to reach folks, um, you know, during those times of the year when they're really likely to be using firewood, so. Okay, so I want to go into the firewood comparison report a little bit. This was a giant undertaking on our behalf. Uh, we published the first version of it last year, early last year. We've republished a few different versions because things are constantly changing um, and we're about to publish another version next week. We hope to have it out this week, but we ran into um, kind of a new issue that we're, we have to thoroughly go through before we can put out this issue. And I'll talk about that in a minute. minute. But um, what this report has done is kind of made a one-stop shop for any and all information relevant to firewood movement, whether that be um, regulations or even just outreach. So what we did was we looked up any current regulations pertaining to the movement of firewood, whether that be firewood specifically or regulation um, on a pest, pest-based regulation of which, you know, firewood is included in that as a regulated article usually. Um, and that includes both external quarantines and internal quarantines, state quarantines and federal quarantines, literally any sort of regulation you can think about that firewood would be affected by. Um, we tried to include in this report if we were aware of it. Um, and so, and we also included like the links, you know, if there were any to any sort of, um, you know, legal language behind those regulations. So that's Hopefully very useful for anyone who's um, looking for that information and doesn't want to have to dig through, you know, the specific state legal portals to try to find it. You know, this is a great location for that. Um, and I know that some states have used other states regulations as a um, model for their own. So, again, a really great place to look if you're um, trying to do that for yourself. Um, so this being that it is so in depth is much more focused towards forest health professionals. Um, and 
you know, I think that they're probably going to get the most out of it. It's not like the firewood map where we kind of break it down and be succinct as possible and, and put up those best practices for the regular firewood user. We even go into um, the whole certification of heat treatment of firewood and what that environment looks like, especially with the deregulation of emerald ash borer. Um, now that the feds aren't doing it in a lot of different states, do states have their own capacity to have a state-based certification program? Um, that's that green map at the bottom. As you can see, that's a little bit all over the place. So that's really important for the firewood industry. Um, and what I can say is the big takeaway with the regulatory environment is that it's very inconsistent. And it would make sense that we'd see some inconsistencies because different regions of the country, you know, have different species of trees or they have different pests of concern. So you're bound to see some um, irregularities there, but the extent of that is really kind of hard to wrap your head around until you see this report. Um, and then of course, we also dive into the outreach because that, you know, being an outreach campaign, that's really where our expertise lies. And that's where we feel like we have the most, um, you know, influence if we have any influence because a lot of times states, even themselves, have a hard time like creating regulations, you know, and it's sometimes no fault of their own, uh, especially with things like the certification of heat treatment and firewood. There's not always like the legislative capacity to create um, programs like that. Um, but as far as outreach goes, whether there's a regulation or not, you know, best practice information is so important and it's, and it's fairly easy. Uh, relative to everything we've talked about today. And so um, I'm going to dive a little bit more into that. Um, so when I go to, you know, a state-based website, so we looked at state agency websites, um, so Department of Agriculture, Forestry, whatever relevant entities um, for each state. And we also looked at Cooperative Extension, and we looked at state parks, and we looked at the reservation portals for state parks. Um, and what we really like to see when we go to these places is highly visible firewood information. And what I mean by highly visible versus um, low visibility is, you know, if I go to a camping page and I see something like one of these messages right there on the camping page, firewood alert, you know, here's the problem, here's our suggestion. Um, or even if it's a regulation, it's, you know, make sure you don't do this. This is our, this is what's going on in the state. Um, that is so important. It's so great. And it makes us so happy when we see stuff like that. Um, and so a lot of times this is messaging that we've even provided these entities. And, you know, anyone who's interested in messaging, you know, you can always reach out to Lee or me um, because I can just send you 10 different examples. Um, or you can tell me a pest of concern specifically, and I'll give you 10 different examples of something involved in that pest. And you can pull that right out of the email copy and paste, or you can kind of change it up for your needs. Um, but being that I am specifically looking for this information, you know, if, if it takes me five or 10 minutes to find something about firewood uh, that's relevant to the firewood pathway, then it's very unlikely that that's reaching just your regular old firewood user or camper. Um, because they're likely not going in the search thing and saving firewood and trying to see if that's buried anywhere on the website. So messages like this are so awesome. Um, and the whole point of this is to reach people before they actually leave for their destination. Because once you're at a park, um, you know, outreach at the park is, is still great, it's better than nothing, but the person has or has not already brought firewood with them from who knows how far away. So, you know, getting people as they're planning for their camping trip is just the best opportunity to mitigate that risky behavior. Um, oh, and then I would just mention, you know, as far as outreach at the actual, you know, park or campground or, or wherever, um, then you kind of want to have messaging that's addressing someone if, if they did already bring firewood. So best practices, you know, would be depending on where you are, if there's a firewood ban or whatever, burn all of your firewood before you leave. Don't leave it for the next person. You know, the longer that firewood sits out, the more likely that uh, if it is infested with an invasive species, it's going to emerge. So things like that. Um, 
it really takes kind of sitting back and thinking for a second the practicality of all of this. And so reaching people before they leave is the best. Once you're at the location, you know, changing up that messaging for whatever makes sense for that area. Um, so going into this a little bit more, um, looking at these four different metrics, as I mentioned, state agencies tend to do the best. Um, and this is most often the Department of Agriculture, uh, which makes sense because that tends to be the regulatory body behind a lot of regulations that actually affect firewood movement. So, you know, it makes sense that you'd see it on their websites. And that's great. And that, avail or that information should absolutely be available. And it often is. Um, however, again, when we think about what does this mean in the real world? You know, that is definitely reaching people, but is it reaching the people who are using firewood the most? Tough to say. Um, we think that the people who use firewood the most recreationally are, are going to websites more like state parks, especially. Um, so we looked at cooperative extension, like I said, the state parks and then those reservation portals and not doing as well in those locations. Um, the orange bar here would be low visibility information, uh, which tends to be cooperative extension the most just because by way of their nature, they do a lot of like articles um, and that can be highly visible information for, you know, a month or two, however long that article is like on their main page and then it tends to get buried and archived. And so even though the cooperative extension site might have that information, again, it's just someone visiting those sites or, uh, looking up a pest or whatever, it's not likely that you're going to see an article on, um, you know, firewood pathway from 2005, for instance. So it's there, but it's not necessarily jumping out at anyone. Um, state parks do fairly well, um, and that has gotten better since we first published this. So that makes us feel good, you know, that a lot of people have, you know, either watched one of these webinars or saw the report and they realized that, you know, their state didn't have that information there and, and you know, change that. And so that's, that's awesome. Um, but I will say probably the most important place to reach firewood users, um, you know, specifically campers would be those reservation portals. And that's where we have a lot of room for improvement still. And, and similar to the state parks, general information has improved since last year, but there's still a lot of room for improvement. Um, and I'll even go into a little bit more of that here in a minute. Um, but if you're interested in seeing like how your state's doing with that, the table on the right here that's a little covered up. Um, gives you a really good snapshot and just comparison among um, the states in the country of just like how each state is doing in terms of visibility there. And um, each state also in the appendices of the report has an entire summary telling you exactly what's going on and again, any relevant links. Um, and that's, you know, another thing that we try to keep as updated and accurate as possible. So if you see something going on in your state that's not right or a dead link, like please, please reach out to me and be happy to fix that um, as soon as I see it, especially if you get it to me before this next um, revision, that would be awesome. Okay, so the little hiccup that we ran into that, you know, pushed our revision publication just by an, a week is um, another inconsistency, another realm for inconsistency in the world of firewood. So we about 21 states, I believe, um, use Reserve America as their reservation um, portal for online reservations of camps, state camp lands, campgrounds. Um, and interestingly enough, there's actually two different avenues that you could reserve the same exact campsite at uh, the same exact park. And one is through going through like Reserve America website itself, and the other is going to through whatever state park website you're interested in, and then it it's like a part of Reserve America, but it actually has the potential to show you different information. So this is something I ran into very recently, and we were like, oh no, here we go. This is a whole nother place where you know we can see some inconsistency. And this is a really great example with Oregon, given that they had that recent discovery of emerald ash borer. Um, you know, someone did the right thing, very smart, put the firewood alert talking about the issue, our remote ask for, giving some best practice information. Uh, they, they even have a regulation up now. Um, 
but as you can see, it's only on the one website. So anyone who goes to reserve a campsite through reserveamerica.com specifically will see this really awesome, highly visible firewood information. Anyone who goes to reserve, you know, a park at, or a campsite at the Sammy Zach Park through Oregon State Parks will not see that information. So how many people, you know, is that not reaching that it could be reaching? Um, that's that's an issue. And since I've realized this, like last week, um, I've already found two other states that have the same problem. So um, I have nine more states to look at that use this, and then we'll see, you know, how persistent this problem is. And so actually, if there's anyone on this call who does this um, as part of their job or knows, you know, a good contact, we're really interested interested in finding out exactly how this works and then you know um, putting in the report and saying like hey if you're um, putting any information make sure you're doing xyz so that it's consistent through both portals okay uh so that's the firewood comparison report Lee, would you mind putting up the landing page for that i know it's, it's an older version right now but it'll be the same landing page um, for anyone who is interested in looking at that report and seeing what's yep. going on in their area i will put Thank it you. in the chat as you do your next slide i'll be right Appreciate back it. yep okay uh and so this is just to talk about you know some examples of our partner collaborations we work with anyone and everyone who's like doing kind of sort of related work to us so anything with invasive species um you know other educational outreach campaigns we are happy to work with on a regular basis and so here are just some examples would be nades must play clean go i mentioned that um play aware play clean go awareness week is in june and we really try to um, boost up their outreach as much, as much as possible. I know they do a lot as well for us, especially during firewood month. Um, and then also, as I mentioned earlier, just building custom graphics for partner organizations, whether that be state, tribal, regional partners, really anyone who's looking to spread this sort of awareness, we are happy to work with. And as I mentioned, that is a free service we provide. Um, again, we don't do any printing costs. Um, but we work with our graphic folks, um, you know, the exact sort of imagery, background, pest, wording, whatever it is you want, um, we curtail that to your needs and then provide it. And then we, you know, showcase it in our resource library. Um, we also work with other organizations like Firewood Scout and try to make sure messaging is consistent among um, folks like that. And then more recently, you know, we partnered with the Firewood Bank like a federal program um, with some professional development messaging and inf background information for them as well. Um, but the list goes on and on. Um, as I mentioned, like anyone who's interested in getting this information out, we're happy to work with. Um, the more awareness we can spread, the better. So, uh, And then we're getting into paid advertising. So Lee, do you want to take over this one? I'd be happy to. Um, please note that I did put into the chat the um, comparison report link if you'd like to open that page and save it for later. Um, and that has the 2022 July comparison report. Um, but hopefully next week it'll have Laurel's fresh version, especially with this new um, Reserve America double portal issue. We're, we're just giving it another week to make sure we don't make any mistakes um, in representing that information. Okay, paid advertising. So the Don't Move Firewood campaign as a whole receives um, federal cooperative agreements, which are basically like grants. And some of those cooperative agreements um, provide us with funding to do targeted and also generalized advertising. And the various types of paid advertising that we're engaging in right now are listed. So let me tell you what each is. Uh, we have a, a grant through Google to do um, AdWords. It's um, in kind. So basically they donate ad space to us and we manage that through our cooperative agreement funding so that we take good care of it. That means that like if you type in um, like firewood near me, uh, Los Angeles or something like that, there's a good chance, although not guaranteed that you'll get a little advertisement that says, learn more about don't move firewood to find firewood near you, that's us paying for that ad word. Uh, we do uh, banner ads um, on selected sites that are relevant to outdoor travelers that might use firewood. So for instance, we pay for banner ads in um, a, like a bunch of fishing magazine online sites. So if somebody wants to 
look up their favorite online fishing magazine and learn about, you know, what's going on in the fishing universe, you know, those people often uh, have a campfire. So you, they might see a banner ad, little sort of box ads um, on those sites from us. That is a Don't Move Firewood logo ad. Uh, we do Facebook advertising, which is shown to broad-based demographics that are not our Facebook followers. And then we do boosted or promoted posts, which themselves are shown to our, I think it's 17,000 um, Facebook uh, page followers. So we both broadcast to selected geographies and demographics across Facebook usership, as well as um, increase the viewership from our own Facebook uh, followers of our own messages. So we, we do both of those. Uh, we do print publication advertisements. Uh, the two examples in front of you, I believe are both print publication proofs. Um, and those are typically um, annual or biannual magazines, travel guides, um, or sometimes actually monthly. Um, so places like uh, RV magazines, uh, the um, like Travel Oregon is one that we've um, done, which is like uh, run by the uh, promotion um, of tourism agency within Oregon. Uh, we do that for, I think we've, I don't believe we're doing it for Visit Montana this year, but we've done it for Visit Montana in the past. Uh, we promote uh, North Dakota Living runs one of our publications, for instance. And we try to do half page or full page so that there's pretty good visibility of those. Another great example is the Old Farmer's Almanac runs a full page ad that we pay for. Um, so those are physical print publications that reach relevant audiences. And then sometimes we do other projects when they're available. So if somebody has funding and says, hey, you know, um, I have a few thousand dollars and I'd like to post a billboard in a high traffic area of firewood concern, then we will create that billboard, provide it to you as a digital file, and then you can use your funding or your um, year end funds if you're on a grant and you've, and you've got a difference in forecast um, in order to place that advertisement um, with your money, but uh, our ads. So all of these put together create a pretty complicated paid advertising universe that we hope really creates a comprehensive coverage um, of reaching as many of the millions of people that use firewood every, every year. Um, if you have questions about our paid advertising, um, that's my specialty. Laurel does more of the straight outreach and research and I, I run the paid advertising so you can come to me um, and I'd be happy to explain more of that to anyone. Uh, next slide, please, Laurel. So this is it, and we made it. We're perfect timing because we've got almost a full half hour for question and answer. First of all, I'd just like to say many thanks to USDA APHIS for their continued financial support. We fund the vast majority of this campaign through cooperative agreements with um, APHIS, which, if you're not familiar, is the Animal Plant Health Inspection Service. Um, it is a uh, similar to the Forest Service, but focuses more on um, animals and plants as opposed to forests, <laughs> to oversimplify things. Um, and they are also the holder of the federal regulations for most of these forest pests when they are regulated. Um, our emails, uh, so remember I'm Lee and the other person who's, you've been listening to is Laurel, are listed. And then now we have uh, 26 minutes um, I would ask that if you have questions, take yourself off mute. If you're um, having trouble with your audio, type it into the chat and then we'll read it out and then answer it. Um, so this now is time for everyone else. So please, questions and comments. And also Laurel can navigate back to a slide if you had a very specific question um, pertaining to a slide. So just ask, ask for that if necessary. Heidi, I see your hand is raised. I love this new hand feature on Zoom. Go ahead, please. Thanks. I'm glad I found that. Um, so one of, and well, I'll just start off to say that um, I work in uh, Michigan DNR within our state parks. And one of the th things that we hear commonly through our surveying of our state park users um, is something along the lines, and and this is related to our history with forest pests, particularly EAB, something along the lines of, um, emerald ash borer is really not very dissuasive. It's not a very good uh, poster bug to stop people from, you know, especially in some of uh, the areas that we work in, um, to say, don't move firewood, uh, buy it locally, because folks will say, well, 
it's a lost cause. You know what? It's already spread through Michigan. Um, and so that is the expectation with any other bug. You know, people get that very, um, uh, you know, the, the downside of things, you know, I'm just one person and it's only my, you know, one load of firewood um, kind of thing. So I'm, I'm curious to know if you have encountered that in any of your surveying um, and if there are ways to, that you've found to, to address that, um, you know, we often focus on you know, most people that are moving firewood don't want to kill trees. I mean, we know that um, in, in surveying and it's um, when, we talk to folks that comes out very clearly. So are there any suggestions that you have to, to turn that narrative a little bit? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, one, of the, one of the issues that has happened through many years of firewood and forest pest messaging is that we tend to uh, accidentally focus on poster pests as, as you call it, right? So you're like, you know, save trees from emerald ash borer, save trees from emerald ash borer. And, and you say that for enough years and people think the problem is emerald ash borer. And then when you have a situation like you do in Michigan where emerald ash borer, it's true, you're probably right now not making it worse if you move firewood because it's already reached peak uh, spread within the Michigan ash range or at least close to it, which is really sad, but it may be a reality for a large part of your state. Well, in truth, we never should have focused the firewood-based messaging so heavily on emerald ash borer in the first place. And so trying to change that narrative to, it's not about a single pest, it's about all the things that can be moved on firewood. And we do our very best to talk about the pests and the bugs um, in a, this is but one example type format, because I think you're very much right. People get a pessimistic feel. It's not going to be like, I won't move bugs. Um, it's too late. Um, it's not too late for so many things. It's certainly not too late for spotted lanternfly to have less of a you know, dispersal rate within the state of Michigan. That is not too late. And that is a pest that absolutely is moving around on firewood. Um, it's not too late to make sure that we don't spread the little spot infestations of Asian lover and beetle all over the United States. Um, absolutely not too late. So making sure that you generalize it to firewood and sort of precaution instead of hyper-focusing on a single bug um, is definitely a thing that we suggest. And, and Heidi, you're absolutely right. People can get too wrapped up in, it already happened. It's going to happen anyway. Um, yeah, yeah, you can, so even, folks, you can yeah. even say things like emerald ash borer was just the beginning. <laughs> you know, like oh man, that's not foreboding. Not yeah. Thing, but, yeah. Well, Laurel, that's a great um point because that is often, you know, what we'll reference to say, well, we have that experience here. We don't want that to happen with, you know, Asian longhorn beetle or yeah. any other um subsequent pest. But it's, you know, people sometimes get a little defeatist um with that and just saying, well, look what's happened and it's just me. And you know, there's some times that. Um, I did also want to add another comment um, about messaging um, and that depending on the site, um, at least for us, you know, sometimes really directing people to gather things on site doesn't work well because that could be encouraging, you know, people to take a lot of dead and downed woody debris that we need. Um, and also, you know, we've run into some enforcement issues where, um, you know, people could actually be violating uh, state land rules and, and things like that. And people don't really like that either. So, um, but yeah, thanks again. <laughs> yeah, Heidi, so you get to a really great, really, really great point, which is that each of our positive behaviors needs to be evaluated by the local people doing the outreach. So in many places, gathering or collecting is completely off the table, um, whether that's for resource damage or violating a, a, a rule or um, there's just such visitation that it's going to result in the basically like denuding of the entire facility around the campground. But in other places, believe it or not, we've had people who are encouraging collection um, on site. They're like, no, we want people to collect firewood. Like, you know, we have so much downed wood, it's a fire hazard, whatever it is, you know. Um, so each of our firewood messages, um, our custom materials, we try to really drill down into what's right for your, your state or your park or your forest, um, you know, collecting or not, heat treatment or not. In some places, you don't even want to encourage people to buy firewood because they're going to get really mad at you for telling 
than what to do, <laughs> which is a phenomenon we've run into it in a few places. It's just a culture of you can't tell me what to do, in which case we don't tell them to, to buy firewood. You know, we try to really frame in other messages to avoid alienating people or making them become defensive. So yeah, that's a great point. I would just add to that too. Um, I think part of the message, so, you know, it's, our campaign is don't move firewood. You're already telling someone what not to do. And I think just adding in, you know, um, a positively framed like empowerment statement along with that is often really helpful and important. So, you know, buy it where you burn it, buy local, burn local, Canada does, you know, something like that. Um, to kind of counterbalance that don't do this and this is a problem you know and all that like kind of doomsday focused outreach which can be counterproductive um, and then also just to kind of plug um, a study that we did with some researchers for, from Clemson that kind of backs up that point and shows that like you know positively framed empowerment messaging tends to be the most effective messaging um, also on our on our news tab you can find that study it was published last summer i believe um and it kind of goes into different outreach strategies and what has um shown to be more effective and more um positively received by folks yep. and that that is that empowerment messaging laurel can you tab back to the paid advertising page yes yeah so you'll see that on these two particular advertisements we don't headline don't move firewood um Oftentimes that's not the best headline because it has a negative slant. We have the firewood alert and we have the buy it where you burn it for these particular ones. Now, again, we don't always tell people to buy it where you burn it. It depends on the, the region and the intent. Um, but it's a good example of like, we need to customize our message to fit the, the, the best and most practical positive behavior that we want people to do. And then they need to learn they shouldn't be moving firewood long distances too. Um, yeah, and also like as far as empowerment goes, like um, not only empowering the public, but we hope to empower other educators and especially like um, folks from DNR and forestry agencies because part of that study showed that um, the messenger themselves is really important for how well that information will be received by the public. And, um, you know, agencies such as forestry agencies um, tended to be the most trusted messenger for folks. And so, yeah. you know, have the best shot, best shot of actually being listened to. And so I think that's really important information for anyone who works for an agency like that. Like you have a lot of more sway than um, other organizations. And so making sure that you take, you know, advantage of that and have, best practice information if you don't have a regulation or, or you know, um, putting forth that regulation if you do. And just, just trying to get that information out in a highly visible way is going to have more of an impact than you might realize. Yeah, absolutely. So do we have other questions? I mean, Laurel and I could talk for another, what is that, 16 minutes, but we'd really prefer to hear from you all. I'll mention too, while we're on the page, just while, while you all think, um, you can see on these two posters that they're pretty, they're pretty different. Um, the one on the left, we have our log and bug imagery, which was initially conceptualized by our friends in Missouri, and then has become an incredibly popular image that we use a lot of. But it also has this kind of mountainous mixed conifer hardwood forest, um, which we can't use in North Dakota, which is what the poster on the right is from. So we customize the sort of background art um, for all of our materials so that people think that it feels like their state. So in North Dakota, most of their forestry resources in riparian areas, but they're also really proud of their cool um, hillsides in the Black Hills and so forth. Um, and I'm probably getting that wrong. That might be in South Dakota, but at any rate, that's the landscape that the Dakotans felt would resonate in the poster. So we didn't use the landscaping that looks almost more like Northern Idaho, Western Montana, et cetera, maybe Colorado for the Dakotas. We made sure it looked like what people feel like they're visiting. All right, Christy, I talked long enough to get you to raise your hand. Thank you. Please go ahead. <laughs> 
Uh, a minute ago, when you were answering uh, the other question, you mentioned that in the in this advertisement, you use you know buy it where you burn it, but that you don't always say that. Yeah. What What is the reason in some places where you wouldn't encourage people to buy it where they burn it? Yeah. So um, the most let's see. So the buy it where you burn it. We normally do suggest. Um, the, the small exception is sometimes there's specific parks where you must buy the firewood in the park. Um, so we have to be really careful because that's a little tricky. The bigger issue, which I think I might've stumbled over how I phrased this a little bit actually is the by certified heat treated firewood. Yeah. Because there's parts of the country where there's not certified heat treated firewood on the market. Mm -hmm. And it's almost always in small bundles exceptions exist, but it's almost always in small bundles. So if you're talking to a person who is purchasing it, for instance, for an entire youth jamboree or to heat their home all winter, you're going to alienate them. Um, heat treated firewood is going to be most likely too expensive and not even purchasable at that volume. Uh -huh. So when we work with, for instance, a home heating audience and we're messaging directly towards people buying firewood for the winter, we wouldn't, we would probably use like a buy local message and then not necessarily push the heat treated message. So we yeah. try to really think through like, realistically, are you going to buy little bundles of certified heat treated firewood to heat your home all winter? Heck no, probably not. Yeah. So we, yeah, you don't want to push that message to people who are going to be like, what are they even talking about? You know, cause then it will lie. It'll just, it won't work. Right. Right. Um, it, it's since you mentioned that um, I actually work in a uh, we are a heat treated firewood delivery marketplace and we oh, work cool. with, with local sellers to do that and so I understand when you say that it's not everywhere it, it really isn't there's there's not enough of them out there that actually provide the the heat treated um, but oh my gosh what was my question that I was going with that. Sorry if I derailed you, but my, yeah, it's a great, you know, my interest part. in this was, was really, you know, to find, cause we want to provide, you know, the right wording and the right suggestion, you know, for our audience as well uh, on the importance of heat treated. And we just want to make sure that, you know, we're wording and we're getting the right message out to even our customers, you know, so that's kind of why I, I was, I'm on this today is to just get more information and really figure out what it is that they need to know, you know, how to word Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yeah. And if you, Christy, if you want to reach out to me and email, I can give you, I can just send you like, you know, best practice messaging relevant to, you know, your needs that you just said. Um, and just talk about like just some copy, you know, some example wordings of like why heat treatment is the safer option. Um, you know, That'd be test, awesome. like whatever, you know, like I'm happy to send you some examples of that, that I, that I said, like, you know, you can use directly or just, you know, edit up to however you like it. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate yeah, that. The other, the other resource that's really useful, I think for producers, Christy would be the national plant boards, firewood, um, basically website. They have a big website where there's lots of information. And that's the effort that came before our firewood certification report. So the National Plant Board is um, a professional group of all of the state plant regulatory employees and agencies of each state. And mm -hmm. they have this big, big, huge firewood documentation effort that they took on a few years back. And it's incredibly useful, but it also, to be honest, isn't that easy to find if you're not involved in the regulatory aspect. So wow. Laurel can also send you that firewood stuff so that you have both their perspective, which is separate from ours, um, as well as ours. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so Sasha um, Lodge gives a good question. Um, Heidi, we'll get to yours next. Okay. Uh, and she says, it's hard to measure how many insects have not been introduced or spread. That is extremely true. It's almost impossible to measure a negative. Uh, not quite impossible, but you know, how do we assess how effective this campaign is? Great question. So through the years, we have done public polling to determine whether or not people know and understand that firewood can be an issue and that um, forest pests can move on firewood basically do, are people getting the basics? 
And those polls have shown us that people get the basics when you tell them the information frequently and effectively. But once you stop, they don't retain the information very well, which is probably somewhat intuitive because that's the same reason that private companies promote their own products over and over again. It's because you kind of forget, it doesn't come front of mind. Um, so we do have evidence of um, whether or not people know and understand our messaging. That's actually a separate question from how effective the campaign is. Because it, for the campaign to be entirely effective, they also have to follow through with what they know. And that um, is regrettably both the gold standard of assessing a campaign effectiveness and the one thing that we do not have the resources to undertake at an enormous scale necessary to really assess it, um, which is a disappointing answer, to be honest, that we don't have the ability to do a completely comprehensive assessment and really answer that. But so that I'm not being too much of a downer, what I will say is that Great Smoky National Park put in place a regulation quite some time ago. Gosh, I think it was like eight years ago. And the regulation is you can't bring anything but certified heat-treated firewood into the park. Um, and uh, through the years, they've done a lot at the entry stations of Great Smoky um, at each of their major campgrounds to assess who, who remains bringing firewood into the park. Is it acceptable to certify firewood or is it not? Where is it from? What's going on? They've done a lot of assessments for their park and they can clearly show that firewood entering the park is more and more compliant over time. Things get better over time with repeated outreach and a consistent regulation. And so we do know that in a case where an outreach campaign is consistent and followable, you get effective reduction of risk. Um, Laurel, do you have anything you want to add before we hop over to Heidi's question? Um, no, I, the other thing I would add to that is that, um, you know, that same report I talked about earlier um, about outreach strategies kind of touches upon how, like, awareness has increased since the Don't Move Firewood campaign oh, became yes. a thing. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, we can demonstrate that awareness is increasing gradually over time with the efforts of our campaign. Um, that is definitely achievable. So that's good. We, we're glad. Otherwise, it would be uh, demoralizing and we would want to figure out how to improve things. So, okay, Heidi, what can I do for you? Um, yeah, thank you. So I have some questions and actually some more thoughts um, related to the pandemic and how that could have influenced behavior for firewood movement. Um, we know we've got some surveying from pre-pandemic about firewood use and RV users and that they're more likely to bring it. Um, now, during the pandemic, we had um, messaged, be prepared when you come to the park because, you know, we our staffing levels are lower. You don't want to interact mm -hmm. with people mm -hmm. and so on. Um, and our user numbers have gone up. And I think that's true for a lot of state park and um, national park uh, partners. That's just kind of the trend. Um, RV sales have uh, gone up as well. And we're seeing a shift in that kind of use, um, at least in our business. So I'm, I'm curious if there are any surveys that you know, if, if those things truly have influenced firewood behavior, are people moving firewood more because you know of the influence of the pandemic, wanting to be prepared or be self-contained? Um, and using um, RVs more. Um, have you tailored messaging at all or have any suggestions on messaging post-pandemic about some of those behavior changes? It's a great question. So first off, we have not done um, direct research on this exact topic, um, but we definitely did keep an eye on um, trends and phenomenon related to the pandemic throughout the trajectory of camping behavior, especially, because you're right, things got very different briefly. Um, there's some interesting studies that showed that people were camping, generally speaking, closer, generally closer to home, basically like within a one day drive was kind of the new radius, um, much more so than they had been in the past. And um, people who drive either a, a personal vehicle or an RV are, so much more likely to move fire with long distance than somebody who flies, which is pretty intuitive. But uh, um, 
that's also an element of it. So people wouldn't fly to their vacations during the pandemic. They couldn't or they wouldn't. Um, they would drive. And so we do know that things shifted. Um, I We did not have the resources or time to research exactly how that was playing out with firewood. Um, I would be concerned, like you said, that the increase in RV users resulted in increases in potential firewood movement behavior. Um, and we do a lot of outreach to, to RV users as best we can. Yeah, and I I remember reading on, I think, uh, like the KLA put out a report and someone else put out a report because um, they do their own surveys and metrics about, you know, campers and um, the increase in new recreationists and new campers was huge during the pandemic. And so it's likely, you know, of course, that a lot of those people have never come across this information. So it really like, you know, puts the onus on us to like get this information out even more and, and up our efforts as much as we can. Um, again, with that highly visible online information would be most crucial um, because that many more people are camping for the first time due to the pandemic and, um, you know, would, would have no idea about this stuff, even though our campaign's been around for over a decade. So. Right. But what a great opportunity to teach people the right way exactly. from the get go. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Habit forming is so important. And that's one of the reasons that we talk about how it's most important, highest priority to give clear, consistent, um, repeated messaging when people are planning and packing for their trip. Like that's the moment where we want to shine. They want, they need to know what the recommendation or the rule is, and we want to get them to see it everywhere they're planning their trip. But sometimes we'll miss them. And there's still learning opportunities on the way there or in the campground or um, a, a bunch of our national park partners tend to put signs in the bathrooms, which is so smart and very funny. Um, so the signs up in the walls of the bathrooms, um, you know, there's learning opportunities throughout each camping trip. Um, and we do our best to make sure that we recommend lots of them before people pack that RV. But if we missed them, then at least let's catch them once they've parked the IV in the campground and they have to use the bathroom. All right, we have two minutes before officially we're going to um, call it done. Laurel, will you just tab to the uh, slide, the thank you slide, because it has our emails in case anybody missed Oh, them. yeah. Yeah, perfect. So if you have any other questions, I really encourage everybody to reach out to me or Laurel or both if you don't know um, who's going to be the best to answer your question. Um, we'll put this recording on. So if you have a colleague who should have seen it, um, please encourage them. Uh, you should be getting an email from us uh, because everyone had to register for this webinar. That will include like the recording and so forth um, sometime next week once we have it all cleaned up and posted on the internet and so forth. So if anybody has a remaining question, um, this is your moment. Otherwise, Laurel and I will sign off. So anything in the chat? Um, one, I will say one more thing too, Please. Um, just because it's such a big part of my job. Um, keeping our information and materials as up to date as possible is super important to us. And so if, you know, by you know, your job or, or even just if you happen to know of a really good firewood outreach item, link, anything, or if you look at our materials and see that something's out of date or a dead link, like, please, please reach out to me because um, that is such a regular thing that we do is try to like, you know, keep our links alive and make sure that the information that we have for our state summaries is actually happening and current and accurate. <laughs> so, um, please always reach out to me with that information. I'm so grateful when people, you know, shoot me an email and just be like, hey, use this link instead of this one, or hey, like, you know, check out what we're doing over here, and I'm happy to promote that. So That's a great note to end with. So if you know something, tell Laurel, because she can, yeah. uh, <laughs> she can make sure that the whole world knows it and that we get it right, which is really yeah. a very high priority of ours, especially when it comes to regulations. You know, we're not an agency, we're a nonprofit, and we really want to represent this correctly for people. So. All right, well, with that great note, thank you everyone. I'm gonna turn off the recording and then we are going, I can't figure out how to turn off the recording. There it is. Uh, and then we're gonna say goodbye, so.